I'm down to start like cycling or something like that or yeah. HGH or whatever. I heard if you do a little bit of the HGH, it's kind of fine. Yes, that's exactly what you want. What's up, guys? Derek, more plays, more to com. Today, we're going to be reacting to the Joe Rogan podcast with Andrew Schultz. So... Um, a bunch of people were DMing me talking about how Joe Rogan mentioned his uh, HGH dosage in the podcast. Um, I've discussed his HRT protocol before, and uh, he had admitted many times he was on thyroid replacement, HGH, testosterone. And for some reason, no one, like, I guess he does so many podcasts that if you if you missed it, you know, like he might only mention it once every like fucking hundred episodes or something. So in this one, he actually mentions his current dosage as well as elaborates on some peptides that I thought were uh, of note. So basically going to be uh, digging into it a bit and kind of uh, giving my stance on it. My doctor actually told me about peptides a long time ago. Yeah, they uh -huh. accentuate healing. Okay. There's a lot of articles about them. Like okay. athletes swear by them. Yes. Particularly BPC-157. Yeah, so BPC-157 and yeah, peptides are some of them a lot more useful than others. Some of them have very interesting applications from artificially enhancing uh, melanin production in the body. You can literally make yourself uh, tanned even if you are normally an albino. I don't know if you saw my video on, uh, what was her name? Martina Blank or whatever. I forget what her name was, but she basically turned herself from white into literally black um, just by using a ton of melanotan too. Um, and I've actually used melanotan a lot in the past and it is something that is, uh, you can literally like change your race essentially with this stuff. Not like actually, but like visually. So like there's a lot of interesting applications with peptides, some more useful <laughs> than others. And BPT-157 in particular, is one of the uh, premier heal healing compounds that uh, works exceptionally well. Like my mom, for example, had a chronic shoulder injury for years, like over a decade from tennis. And within literally two weeks of using BPC-157 in her shoulder, she started to experience pain relief and improvement in uh, range of motion and power and all that kind of stuff. So definitely has a very interesting uh, interplay and there are a lot of uh, peptides that I have great interest in too. Um, GHK Copper, Epitalon, um, TB500, BPC157, Melanotan 2, um, PT141, you know, other ones that are uh, of note too, but anyways. Okay. There's uh, a lot of evidence that it accelerates healing from injuries mm -hmm. and a lot of like elite athletes swear by it i, I just believe started sada has banned them so usada has banned some of them but bpc 157 in particular is not banned and it is one of the most effective if not the most effective for healing so they banned tb 500 they haven't banned bpc 157 and i suppose that's because it doesn't necessarily fit their criteria of a performance enhancing drug necessarily but, you know, it's very potent at promoting uh, angiogenesis, um, tissue repair, like uh, um, tendon healing, like a lot of things even that are chronic. It can help uh, accelerate, just even instigate the healing in an area that would otherwise have insufficient blood flow, essentially. It can be problematic too, though, which should be noted in terms of cancer cell development. So if you inject an area or just inject it at all and you promote angiogenesis and you basically encourage the rapid spread of cancer growth. If you have a tumor and you introduce BPC-157 into the mix, not a good combo as you would imagine. However, in especially in body parts that are like, you know, hard to get blood to necessarily, they're not as like, uh, you know, vascular and things of this nature. It's uh, tendons in particular are an area that uh, BPC-157 really excels in uh, dramatically increasing the uh, healing rate. It also has a very interesting interplay with the brain gut axis so it's sort of like the hypothalamus pituitary gonadal axis or hpta um except the h g a like or the brain gut axis it's something that can regulate uh, neurotransmitter production as well as just like overall gut health so it has a lot of interplay with uh autoimmune issues inflammatory things just overall like if you've looked into gut health at all in the past few years it's like a exploding industry right now and it is widely misunderstood but bpc 157 seems to have a very potent interplay with uh, promoting gut health so 
that's a uh, of note too. I don't think. See if that's true, because I think Chad Mendez was, was using uh, it. Was using a peptide. Yeah, and he got he got in trouble. Yeah. So some of these peptides, you know, ones that you can prove like increased growth, growth hormone secretions, which is otherwise seen as a performance enhancing element, those are banned. But BPC one five seven not banned at all. I think that was one of the things he got in trouble with. I don't think he knew they were banned. I'm about it. I was telling you earlier, like I'm down to start like cycling or something like that or yeah. HGH or whatever. I heard if you do a little bit of the HGH, it's kind of fine. Yeah, I guess uh, a little bit of the HGH can be kind of fine depending on what your goals are, you know, what uh, how old you are. Yeah, but, um, you know, a lot of these, uh, like that mentioning the athlete getting busted for peptides without knowing it's banned, it's like, these guys must be looking like very in depth at what is banned before they inject themselves with something like GHRPs, for example, which I'm pretty sure what that guy got busted for. You literally have to pin it, like literally inject it into your body. It's not something you just like a pill you took and you thought it might have been a supplement. You literally have to inject it into yourself. So what is the likelihood that you took it without thinking it was banned when it's right there on the banned list? Like... I would say pretty fucking low unless you like thought you were getting BPC and you got like accidentally got like tainted GHRP or something. Yes, that's exactly what you want. You and, want like one unit. That's what I take. I take like one unit a day. And doesn't change the way you look or anything like that? Well, you get big. If you get bigger, okay. it's going to change the way you look. Like, okay, so that is Joe's uh, current protocol, supposedly one IU GH. So is that a potent dose? No, in fact, you could argue that is just therapeutic replacement because that is barely going to put you to the top of the reference range for IGF-1. So um, that is a very normal dose, a very reasonable dose. It's not going to lead to hyperglycemia. It's not going to lead to significant insulin resistance down the line. It's not going to lead to diabetic neuropathy or any of the things that um, are commonly associated with, uh, you know, GH abuse or, uh, you know, the negative deleterious outcomes of uh like what you would see in like acromegalic patients and whatnot who have uh like igf1 excess caused by a condition um that is a very normal dose so it sounds like he's about to get into uh what kind of morphological changes you can sort of expect like, like craniofacial development stuff like this and uh let's see what he says face will fill out your neck will be bigger yeah you know your shoulders will be bigger you're gonna get bigger if you lift weights but if you don't lift weights and yeah. you take that stuff and you keep your body fairly lean yeah you'll, you'll you know okay so he's basically saying if you lift weights and you use a unit of gh your face and everything will get bigger and it's like eh, that's a really low dose like you might get some like intracellular like fullness in certain areas just from the gh like hypersaturating your entire like being essentially like just when you start gh and like one of the first things you notice you pack on a little bit of uh a film of water and it looks uh it looks good though like it's like i am weight like intramuscular weight that looks uh gives you that pop and that kind of a bit more of a 3d look but it can also bloat your face bloat a bunch of areas of your body that would otherwise look more chiseled leaned out etc without it and this is why bodybuilders were cut out will often cut out gh before the competition because it can lead to a film of water that is uh, blurring their definition. As far as the statement of your face will not grow if you're not lifting and it will grow if you are lifting, like, I don't know how accurate that really is. Like what I can say though is, I've done videos in the past on how your face will change when you gain muscle or lose muscle. And this is uh, the most recent video I did discussing this was talking about uh, Vigorous Steve and his uh, facial changes after he stopped taking gear and he went on PCT recently and his face you know, like essentially de-aged like 10 years. Um, not actually, but like, you know, objectively to a lot of people, it looks like he, you know, shaved at least a handful of years off of his age just by losing the massive amounts of like temporary weight he was holding as well as stripping some muscle off, to be honest. And this sort of harks back to my first video I did on it. I think it was called uh, um, the fat head effect in bodybuilding or something like that. And you see often with these guys, not just from the GH abuse, but also from just sheer holding more muscle, the amount of fullness you get everywhere, the look in the face, like you see the top guys on the Olympia stage with the most muscle mass, they all have giant heads. And it's not like, even though they're literally like 5% body fat on stage, their heads do not look lean whatsoever. And it, a lot of it boils down to the amount of tissue on your body. It gets distributed evenly. Like it's not like you will not gain size on your face that has muscles in it too, when you're getting muscle everywhere else. So you have these guys like 
like Kai Green, for example, one of the most jacked guys, you know, crazy, crazy physique, you know, one of the, uh, you know, legendary bodybuilders, his face from start to finish is like unrecognizable. Like the guy's face now, even if he's single digit body fat percentage, his face resembles what a natural guy would look like at like 30% body fat in his face. And that's just, you know, some people are, you know, more fortunate than others that can get that kind of like death face look even with a ton of muscle on their frame, but often you see in a linear fashion, the face has a harder time getting that lean chiseled look just by the sheer amount of tissue sitting on there and how much, you know, mineral retention, water retention, you know, glycogen, nitrogen, blah, 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 that everything can hold around your body in unison when it comes to using these exogenous hormones on top of one another. And when you hold that super physiological amount of muscle, it is also going to be reflected in your literal face tissue. I'm just trying to find the balance where I don't like change the shape of my body and head. Because what you just said to me was so normal. Like what you said, it was really normal. You were like, yeah, like your head will grow. So yeah, GH, like (laughs) that's literally what it does though too. You have to understand when you're a teenager, what is it that's going to propel you into like from a boy to a man, it's going to be driven through like androgen exposure to develop uh, like differentiate you from a fucking child and grow your penis and shit like that. But also it's going to be your growth hormone production and the interplay with your estrogen levels and whatnot too. But it's, it's largely boiling down to your GH IGF one axis and how it's being regulated in your teenage years. So expecting you to not have, you know, connective tissue growth, bone growth, et cetera, when you're introducing a super physiological amount of GH and consequently IGF one into your system as an adult, you know, it's silly. You're going to have, you know, your nose is going to get bigger. Things are going to get bigger. It's not going to be dramatic at one IU. It may be unnoticeable for years and years and years. It may go unnoticeable entirely if you are a guy who otherwise, like he said, is not going to be lifting and packing on weight because, like I said, the more tissue you physically accrue, the more temporary weight you then hold via, you know, glycogen, water, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, like... <laughs> It's not like you're going to just like wake up one day and have a giant fucking head. But like for Joe Rogan in particular, like I would not be surprised if the GH use over the years has cumulatively increased his head size to some extent. And I've talked about this before in the past about the changes that have been uh, noted in the past 30 years on his uh, nose, just the skin on the face, etc. But he's way more jacked than he used to be too. So you have to keep in mind a lot of this comes down to his body weight and the muscle weight on his frame. And, you know, obviously diet practices, how carb dense is your diet, how much water are you holding, blah, blah, blah. So it's not all attributed straight to GH, but it certainly contributes to that overall accrued tissue on the skull and the kind of like hyperinflated look that you get from GH. One IU, again, though, is a very normal dose, physiologic amount. With pharma grade GH, though, one IU, like, is that going to be higher or lower than what your endogenous levels would be as a natural at... 40 plus years old like i guess it depends on the person but it is actually like a reasonable dose has he been on one iu for 20 plus years though or has he like pushed the limit a handful of times or what like i don't really know that's just speculation at the end of the day but what we can see is his facial changes over the years and then you know we speculate from what uh from what information we're given and here andrew Schultz is kind of trying to dig into it i don't know how uh careful he's trying to be around the subject because i think you know he knows as well as Joe that like some, you know, craniofacial changes have occurred and whether Joe gives a fuck or not. I think it's like a pretty common occurrence. Like you see in bodybuilders all the time, their faces do not even resemble when they started, but it's more dramatic the more muscle they gain typically. And occasionally with the amount of growth hormone they're using too. Like we've seen some bodybuilders historically have had massive facial changes. And those are the guys who famously use like fucking 15 I use plus for a long period of time. So hopefully Joe does not fall in a camp of like abuse for several years. And this is more so a, you know, reversible thing. If he just wanted to, uh, I'm not saying it's bad or anything. I'm just saying like, there's definitely like some difference and it's not risk-free if that's something you actually care about when it comes to adding body weight, adding lean body mass and introducing exogenous hormones into the mix. But again, one I use a very responsible and reasonable dose that is likely not going to be problematic in any aspect really at all. You know, like your IGF-1 will be within physiologic levels. You're going to have good glucose control if you otherwise would have with a good diet and lifestyle. It's not going to be like significantly enhancing the development of like acromegalic like features at that dose probably. Um, and it's uh, not going to be that extreme in terms of the bloat, you know, potential carpal tunnel type symptoms, stuff like that. It's a very normal physiologic amount. Yeah, that's the same like thing.
head's growing. That's the same but if you get John, to the actual John, skull John, itself, it's basically the same John, size. John. Uh, Chad Mendes did have a peptide, but it was something called GHRP6. Okay, so yeah, Chad Mendes got popped for GHRP6, which is a ghrelin receptor agonist and growth hormone releasing peptide. And it is the most potent appetite stimulating peptide of them all and it's fucking horrible if you're trying to uh diet down it's like <laughs> if you are trying to stick to a good calorie amount per day like a reasonable amount either maintenance or in a deficit do not touch this stuff it'll literally if i was ever to do a 10 or 20 000 calorie challenge normally actually i could probably do a 10 000 calorie challenge pretty easily even without it but if i was to actually try and kill like a 20 000 calorie challenge all i would need is some GHRP6 and I'd be fine. You know, it's that dramatic in how much it increases your appetite. It's also very dramatic in how much it fucks up your insulin sensitivity though too, unfortunately, and cranks your blood glucose up. And MK677 realistically is basically like the oral equivalent of jabbing GHRP6 like six times a day, realistically. So is that a compound that's worth using in the UFC? Like, fuck no, dude. It's a synthetic agent. It's easy to detect. Whoever was guiding him on that was... uh I don't know, just uh, completely absent-minded in the fact that it is tested for and it is not bioidentical and the performance enhancing benefit it would yield is so negligible. It's just like a horrible compound to use, especially for somebody who's probably trying to make weight for a weight class. Like why would you ever use GHRP6 in the UFC? In my opinion, it would be a, like I would be leveraging real GH if I'm going to try and circumvent and skirt around the testing way easier to get away with something bioidentical than it is to get away with something synthetic that increases the bioidentical hormone to a negligible amount in contrast. Okay, so it's another peptide. Yeah. There's thymoisin, there's a few different peptides, but all of them uh, athletes like to use because it accelerates healing. Do you do anything, any sports or anything? Yeah, so um, BPC-157, I wouldn't be surprised if it's heavily abused, well not abused, heavily used in the UFC. You know, it's, uh, I think USADA put out a like warning earlier this year saying it's untested and blah, blah, blah. I'm trying to like, I don't know if they're just trying to actually keep people safe or if they're just trying to discourage its use, but it is, they've even stated themselves it's not banned. I don't even think it was added to their watch list either. Like they are aware of it because they've talked about it, but they do not find it problematic enough to add to their list yet. So this is a compound that, especially if you're a fighter, like a fucking no brainer to be including. Like it's very, very good at what it does, especially for guys who are, you know, very prone to injury or experience injury often. It can expedite your healing by months, potentially. You need, you need to play basketball. I was playing bit. ball and then I kind of stopped playing ball. And then um, I, uh, I box, kickbox a little bit. That's oh, what yeah? I do for like uh, exercise, yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Okay, so now they're just talking about hobbies and whatnot. Presumably, uh, I'll be honest, it's kind of hard to get around and interject every like 10 to 11 seconds when these guys are talking to not get hit with a copyright thing. So... I don't have a, a lot more to add. I'm at the 20 minute mark here. So there's uh, I'm going to cut it off. Otherwise, this video is going to get ridiculously long if I go through the whole podcast. But I think that was the bulk of it in terms of the peptides, the HGH, head growth, etc. So hopefully you guys, you guys enjoyed that. A lot of you guys sent it to me and I appreciate it. You know, it's a, a topic I talked about a while ago. It's kind of uh, um, cool to see the actual like dosages brought up that he's currently using. Like he's pretty transparent about his HRT regimen. So it's nice to see him uh, break that down. And uh, Andrew to just like, you know, flat out ask, you know, a very potentially, uh, I don't know, a question that maybe some people will be uneasy to answer who are uh, on the stuff. You know, it's uh, like, I don't know how many bodybuilders would care to even answer that question openly and even say they're using GH, let alone if it, if they think it impacted the head size that they have and have developed over the years. So. You know, good on Joe. He's uh, always been pretty open about that kind of shit. And cool to hear on the BPC-157. And in case you guys didn't know, not being tested for in any professional leagues as far as I know right now. So something to uh, keep in mind if you are somebody who is injured or otherwise could benefit from having something on hand to help you with injury. It's not something proactively you should just use, by the way, necessarily. It is something that should be uh, reserved because it is, again, very pro angiogenesis producing new like literal increasing circulation to something you may otherwise not need like cancer cells is uh, not going to be good obviously so if you don't need it don't just like 
don't just use it, you know? Like some people use this stuff just randomly throughout the year because they think like, oh, it's gonna help me prevent injuries. And it's like, be sparing with its use, you know? It's one of those things. It's like cartering. You don't just like randomly use it for no fucking reason. If you've seen all the cancer data, like you would know if you were going to use it, it was going to be for a very specific application for a very specific performance enhancing outcome rather than just year round because it's fun to have a bit more endurance in bed or some shit. So anyways, take from that what you will. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe, check out my blog, moreplaysmoredates.com. Follow me on Instagram, at moreplays underscore more dates. Facebook, Snapchat, Bitchu, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. If you want to support the channel, you can check out anything I'm associated with in the video description below, my TRT clinic, um, as well as Gorilla Mind, nootropic formulas, Gorilla Mode, pre-workout formulas I designed myself from scratch, my recommended lab test panels, anything else I'm associated with, it's all in the video description below. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.